The restaurant's candlelight flickered across Kira's face as I gazed into her warm brown eyes. It was our tenth wedding anniversary, a milestone I'd been looking forward to for months. My job had been incredibly demanding lately, but tonight was about celebrating our love and commitment. Happy anniversary, sweetheart, I said, raising my glass of Merlot. Here's to many more years of... The dining room door burst open with a bang, and a tall, slender man swaggered in like he owned the place. I immediately recognized him as Kira's cousin, Marlon, whom I hadn't seen in over a decade. His eyes scanned the room before locking onto our table. Well, well, if it isn't the happy couple, Marlon announced, his voice dripping with condescension as he approached uninvited. Fancy meeting you here. Kira's face drained of color. Marlon, what are you doing here? Can't a guy drop in on his favorite relatives? He slid into the empty chair beside Kira, helping himself to her untouched glass of wine. My stomach nodded as I studied his unshaven face and disheveled shirt. Marlon had always been a smooth talker, but something about his sudden appearance reeked of trouble. We weren't expecting you, I said carefully. Marlon waved a dismissive hand. Surprise visits are more fun, don't you think? No dull expectations to live up to. I haven't heard from you in years, Kira said, her brow furrowed. Where have you been? All over, really. Marlon topped off his glass. I've been exploring my options, let's say. Seeing the world, taking some risks. Maybe it's time I settle down for a bit. He shot me a pointed look. If you'll have me, that is. My jaw clenched at his subtle implication. Of course, we're family, after all. An uncomfortable silence stretched between us. The joyous atmosphere shattered like cheap dinnerware. I fought to keep my expression neutral as Marlon proceeded to dominate the conversation, regaling us with embellished tales I found increasingly hard to believe. When the check finally arrived, Marlon insisted on covering it over my objections. It's the least I can do for my favorite couple, he said with a wink that made my skin crawl. Outside, a cold drizzle had begun to fall. Marlon draped an arm around Kira's shoulders, pulling her close. Why don't we continue the celebration back at your place? I opened my mouth to protest, but Kira spoke first. I don't see why not. You'll have to tell me all about your adventures, Marlon. The glint in Marlon's eyes said he had bigger plans than swapping stories. As we climbed into the car, I couldn't shake the feeling that our carefully constructed lives were about to be disrupted in ways I couldn't fathom. True to his word, Marlon showed no signs of leaving after our disastrous anniversary dinner. He insisted on crashing at our place until he could get back on his feet. Against my better judgment, Kira agreed, still clinging to some misguided familial obligation. Over the next few weeks, Marlon worked his way into our daily routines with maddening ease. He'd lounge around the house, drink my beer, and help himself to whatever he wanted— all while soaking up Kira's attention like a remora to a shark. Rowan's been working too many hours at that soul-crushing job, he'd tell her with a conspiratorial smile. You deserve to be appreciated, sis. I wanted to wring his scrawny neck every time he pulled that fake concern act. But Kira seemed to eat it up, basking in Marlon's flattery while I slaved away providing for us. The more he insinuated his way into her life, the more I felt her drifting from me. Then the Saturday morning things took an even uglier turn. I woke up early, as usual, to find Marlon rummaging through my home office like he owned the place. "'What the hell are you doing in here?' I demanded, startling him. Marlon whirled around, clutching a stack of my private documents. "'Damn, you scared me. I was just looking for a notepad. "'By going through my drawers and confidential files?' He scoffed. "'Don't get your tidy whities in a bunch. I was going to put everything back.' I snatched the papers from his hands. Get out of my office, now. Marlon raised his palms in mock surrender, that infuriating grin plastered across his face. Whatever you say, boss. He pivoted and sauntered into the hallway, leaving the door wide open. When Kira emerged from the bedroom a few minutes later, I knew she'd witnessed part of the confrontation. Sure enough, she cornered me over breakfast. What was that about earlier with Marlon? She demanded, her eyes narrowed with suspicion. I felt a surge of anger at her accusatory tone. He was snooping through my private documents. Who knows what he was really after? That's a pretty serious accusation. Look who you're defending, I snapped. Your dear cousin is up to something, Kira, and I don't like it one bit. Kira crossed her arms. 
jaw taut. Maybe if you weren't always working insane hours, you'd have time to... Don't even go there. I cut her off sharply. You know how hard I work to support this family. I don't need that sleazebag poisoning your mind against me. As soon as the words left my mouth, I regretted them. Kira's face contorted with a mix of hurt and rage. Without another word, she spun on her heel and stormed out of the kitchen, leaving me alone with the fallout of Marlin's scheming. I pressed my palms into the countertop, struggling to control my ragged breaths. This was exactly what that weasel wanted, to drive a wedge between Kira and me. And from the looks of it, his efforts were working better than I could have imagined. After our blowout fight, a suffocating tension gripped the house. Kira started spending more evenings out getting drinks with the girls, while I holed up in my office, burying myself in work to avoid another argument. Our once happy home had become a frigid danger zone, with Marlin prowling the halls like a demented cat toying with two trapped mice. I should have seen it coming, but I was blindsided when Kira finally confronted me about the mounting lies Marlin had been feeding her. Rowan, we need to talk. Her voice was icy as she entered the office. I had coffee with Marlin this morning, and he told me some very disturbing things. My gut twisted. Like what? Like how you've been having an affair with a co-worker named Jessica. White-hot anger lanced through me. That's ridiculous. I would never. He also said you've been mismanaging our finances for years. Kira's nostrils flared with indignation, blowing our savings on frivolous expenses and gambling debts. I shot out of my chair, slamming my palm on the desk loud enough to make her flinch. How can you even entertain that snake's lies for a second? Because everything adds up. Kira shouted back, her cheeks flushed crimson. You've been coming home late more nights than not. You're always holed up in here, obsessing over your work, and every time I try to discuss our finances, you change the subject or dismiss my concerns. That's because I'm trying to provide for this family, damn it. I raked my hands through my hair, struggling for composure. We have responsibilities, in case you'd forgotten. Don't you dare talk down to me. Kira's eyes blazed with a mix of hurt and fury. Maybe Marlin was right. Maybe you've been taking me for granted all along. My mouth gaped open, utterly blindsided. I wanted to scream, to reason with her, to beg her to see Marlin's treachery. But I could only watch, stunned and powerless, as the woman I loved whirled on her heel and stormed out of the room. The silence that followed was deafening, shattered only by the faint murmur of Marlin's hushed laughter from the adjacent hallway. Realization washed over me in an icy torrent. He'd achieved his goal. He'd systematically turned Kira against me, destroying the very fabric of our marriage in pursuit of, what, revenge, greed, sheer malice? A surge of rage unlike any I'd ever experienced boiled up inside me. If looks could kill, the hatred blazing in my eyes would have struck Marlin dead in his tracks. My rational mind screamed for restraint, but my body seemed to move of its own volition. In three long strides, I was towering in front of the weasel, my face contorted into a mask of wrath. You lying son of a bitch, I snarled through gritted teeth. You're going to regret ever stepping foot into this house. Marlin met my glare with those cold, soulless eyes. A snide half-grin crept across his lips. Now, now, dear brother-in-law, he hissed mockingly. No need for such hostility. I'm just trying to look out for Kira's best interests, like any caring family would do. My hands balled into white-knuckled fists. I wanted nothing more than to wipe that smugness from his wretched face, thus to make him beg for the pain to stop until he took back every vile word and righted the damage he'd done. But before I could make another move, the muffled sound of footsteps reached my ears from the stairwell. Kira was coming back downstairs. I shot Marlin one final murderous glare, then stormed back into the office and slammed the door behind me. Though I'd been momentarily robbed of vengeance, I silently vowed that he wouldn't escape unscathed. One way or another, Marlin would pay dearly for tearing my family apart. For the next several days, an uneasy truce settled over the house. Kira and I kept our distances, reduced to trading icy looks and curt responses when forced to interact. All the while, Marlin slithered between us, putting on his concerned friend act whenever Kira was around. She's clearly under a lot of stress, I overheard him telling her one evening as I passed through the den. 
Maybe you should suggest Rowan take some time off to get his head straight. My fists clenched at the sugary venom in his tone, but before I could confront him, Kira appeared in the doorway and fixed me with a pointed glare. That's not a bad idea, she said flatly. You've been working too hard lately. Some time off might do you good. I opened my mouth to protest, but Marlin jumped in with a sage nod. See? I'm just looking out for the best interests of this family. Grinding my teeth, I pushed past them without a word and retreated to my office sanctuary. How dare that bottom feeder meddle in my job, my source of security and self-worth? Outrage mingled with dread as a terrifying thought took root. He was gunning for my career next. Over the following week, my fears proved justified. An internal investigation was suddenly launched at work over misappropriation of funds from one of my prior projects. No specifics, just veiled accusations and heavy scrutiny from the corporate leeches. I knew in my bones Marlin was behind it, but I had no proof. The weasel covered his tracks too well, which meant he was after more than petty mind games now. He was aiming for the jugular. It all came to an ugly head at the office on Friday evening. I was poring over financial records, desperate to find any discrepancy that could exonerate me, when Kira burst through the door of my office. "'You lying, cheating snake,' she spat, hurling a folder of documents at my head. "'I can't believe after everything you'd stoop this low.' I batted away the papers, bewildered. "'Kira, what are you talking about? Don't play dumb!' She jabbed a finger at the scattered forms, auburn curls whipping around her flushed face. I found bank statements and emails proving you've been pilfering money from the company for years. Years! My heart plummeted into my stomach. That's insane. Those documents must be. Don't bother denying it, Rowan. The evidence is damning. Kira's chest heaved with barely contained fury. You've been robbing us blind with your greed and deception. Where did you even find these? I demanded, frantically scanning the fabricated paperwork. My gaze froze on a sticky note with a familiar scrawl. That conniving son of a bitch. Marlin saw them sitting out and knew I deserved the truth, Kira said, her voice dripping with disgust. He warned me about what a selfish liar you were becoming, but I refused to believe it until now. In that moment, the harsh reality hit me like a freight train. Everything, even my career and livelihood, were now casualties in Marlin's warpath of destruction. Fire raged behind my eyes as I shot to my feet, papers scattering in my wake. That depraved, manipulative worm? I roared, slamming my fist onto the desk hard enough to leave a dent in the wood. He's been plotting this all along, don't you see? He's poisoned, Kira. A flicker of uncertainty passed over her face. And then it was gone, replaced by that same simmering wrath. The only poison here is you, she hissed, turning on her heel to stalk out. Keep your lies and dirty money. I want nothing more to do with you, Rowan. I collapsed back into my chair, numb with shock and despair as the office door slammed behind her. Just like that, in one fell swoop orchestrated by Marlin, everything I'd worked so hard to build, my reputation, my career, my marriage, was crumbling to dust. I spent a hellish weekend drowning in self-pity and Jack Daniels. By Monday morning, I'd hit rock bottom, unshaven, reeking of booze and misery, I showed up to the office in wrinkled clothes, bloodshot eyes hidden behind sunglasses as I braced for the final crucifixion. But it never came. Instead, Kira was waiting in the parking lot, looking just as haggard and remorseful as I felt. We need to talk, she said flatly as I trudged closer. Somewhere private. My tongue felt like leather. If this is about the divorce papers, it's not. She inhaled deeply, chewing her bottom lip. It's about Marlin. A surge of anger momentarily lifted my hungover fog. What more does that snake need to slither into? He's already stolen my job and my family. That's just it. Kira's gaze grew pained. Those documents I found, they're fabricated, completely fraudulent. The words hung between us, weighted and damning. I wanted to feel vindicated, relieved that she finally saw the truth. But after so many blows, I just felt numb. How can you be sure? I asked quietly. I hired a private investigator to look into Marlin's past, she admitted. He has a reputation for this kind of sociopathic behavior, using lies and deceit to turn families against one another for his own twisted aims. A sour taste flooded my mouth, anger and hatred reigniting in my gut. That sadistic worm had shattered every shred of trust, every ounce of love Kira and I once shared, 
all for his own sick enjoyment. So now you know, I shrugged weakly. Fat lot of good it does me now. My life is still in ruins. Kira stepped closer, laying a trembling hand on my arm in a gesture that just days ago would have made my heart leap. Now it only wrenched my chest tighter. Not if we fight this together, she said, gaze hardening to steel. If we can expose Marlin, bring his selfish cruelty to light, maybe we can undo some of the damage. I studied her expression, searching for any hint of the doubt or contempt that had consumed us both so thoroughly. But her jawline was set, her eyes clear and determined. The guardians of our past were finally, mercifully gone. How? I asked hoarsely. That worm covered his tracks too well. Nobody's going to believe a couple of bitter divorcees over. That's why we can't just accuse, Kira cut me off. We need solid proof of what Marlin did. Evidence so damning, so irrefutable, it will crush that demented ego of his once and for all. Her hand found mine, giving it a reassuring squeeze. Suddenly I was acutely aware of the scriptured calluses earned from years of teaching, the faint citrus scent of her shampoo that used to linger on our pillows. That investigator already provided copies of testimony from some of Marlin's past victims, she continued. With the right records from our own situation, phone logs, emails, anything he didn't think to tamper with, we can weave together an undeniable trail of his emotional abuse and psychological torture. My head swam as her plan took shape. It was audacious, risky even. But after enduring so much agony, the prospect of vengeance catalyzed a burning fervor within my soul. Okay, I said with a resolute nod. Together, then. No more pulling punches with that manipulative bastard. A grim smile tugged at the corner of Kira's mouth. We hit him with everything we've got. It's the only way to make him pay for what he's done. The fire rekindled behind her eyes reminded me of the strong, passionate woman I fell in love with those years ago. And in that moment, I knew no matter how painful the path ahead, we would prevail or go down swinging. Over the next few weeks, Kira and I operated like silent jembers in an underground bunker. While she dug up call logs, emails, and other digital footprints of Marlin's manipulation, I pored over the files from her private investigator, stomach-churning accounts of how he'd torn apart other families in the past. The more we uncovered, the more grotesque the full picture became. Marlin's grifting stretched back over a decade, spanning multiple states. He was a parasite of the highest order, insinuating himself into the lives of decent people only to feed off their trust and ruin them from the inside out through mind games and sabotage. With hardened resolve, Kira and I compiled an unshakable dossier of evidence detailing the full scope of her cousin's depravity, both in our case and the cases of others he'd systematically dismantled. Once cross-referenced and organized, the combined records painted a damning portrait that would leave no skeptics. Finally, everything was in place to spring the trap. Kira arranged a family dinner under the pretense of her making amends and welcoming Marlin back into the fold. But in reality, we were beckoning that snake straight into the kill box. The look of smug satisfaction plastered across Marlin's face as he strolled into my living room that night was one I'd never forget. Well, well, if it isn't the dysfunctional lovebirds, he crooned, draping an arm around each of our shoulders like we were old pals. So nice for you two to bury the hatchet. We have something to show you, I said flatly, squirming out from under his grasp. Marlin cocked an eyebrow quizzically as Kira hit a button on the remote, firing up a projector displaying photos, documents, and letters from his past victims. His expression remained frozen for a few moments, slowly giving way to a flash of unease. "'What is all this?' he asked in a measured tone. Too late, the mask was already slipping. "'The truth,' Kira spat back, taking a confrontational step forward. "'About who you really are, Marlin, what you've done to ruin the lives of innocent families, all for your own sick amusement.' His eyes narrowed to serpentine slits, panic fracturing that carefully sculpted exterior. "'You two have completely lost your minds, if you think.' I cut him off, rage simmering in my voice. We know exactly what you've been up to, you miserable leech. Sowing lies and discord to tear loving couples apart from the inside, then sucking them dry before slithering off to your next victims. Marlin opened his mouth, but no words escaped, his pallor draining to an ashen gray. For once, he had nowhere to run, nowhere to hide. 
Letter after letter flashed across the screen, a mother recounting Marlon's efforts to destroy her marriage, an ex-girlfriend detailing his physical and emotional abuse, a lifelong lifelong friend turned adversary, each statement more horrifying than the last, and weaved throughout were irrefutable records of his treachery against Kira and me. Manipulated documents, incriminating calls and emails, testimonies of his gaslighting and sabotage. I saw the fight drain from Marlon's posture, but Kira remained locked in, relentless. We have copies of this entire file, she snarled, and they're going to everyone. Your old employers, the authorities, anybody who will listen. Nobody else will suffer because of your deranged crusade, you pathetic cowardly. Enough! Marlon's voice cracked with an anguished rasp as he whirled around, one hand clawing at his face. Just enough. An eerie hush fell over the room as the projector blinked off, plunging us into a heavy silence broken only by Marlon's quivering breaths. I studied the hollow depths of his expression, the broken husk of a man whose entire world was crumbling around him. Revulsion curdled in my gut. This, this was the pieces of him we'd reduced to. And somehow it provided no catharsis at all. The aftermath of our grand unmasking played out in excruciating slow motion. Marlon didn't utter a single word as the weight of his exposed sins bore down. He simply turned on his heel and trudged out, a hollowed-out revenant disappearing into the night. Part of me had anticipated a sense of, of victory, of karmic scales finally balanced. But as the days crawled by without a peep from Marlon's corner, all I felt was empty, hollow like the entire sordid affair had leached away pieces of my soul I'd never recover. Kira tried putting on a brave face, insisting that we'd done the right thing by exposing Marlon's psychological warfare, that his path of destruction had finally ended. But I could see it in her eyes, too, that thousand-yard stare of someone forever changed. We spent the next couple weeks walking on eggshells around each other. Sure, we were on the same side again against a common foe, but that didn't erase months of pent-up doubt and resentment, the gut-wrenching heartache of having our entire foundation shaken to the core. I just started considering counseling options when the other shoe finally dropped. The call came in around 3 a.m., Kira's sister Jenna, distraught and begging us to come over immediately. I don't know what to do, she blubbered when I answered the door. Red grooves lined her ashen cheeks, tears still flowing freely. He just showed up, raving like a lunatic, about making all these outrageous threats. Whoa, slow down, I urged, steadying her trembling frame. Who showed up, Jenna? What's going on? Her haunted gaze met mine, lips quivering. Mem Marlin, he's completely lost it. Like a wolf catching the scent of prey, I felt an electric surge shoot through my system. Without a word, I sprinted down the hall toward the loud commotion reverberating from the den. Jenna's husband, Blake, was there, along with two of his frat brother buddies, attempting to subdue a wild-eyed Marlin thrashing against their restraints. His clothes were disheveled, blonde locks matted with sweat, a broken bottle from the liquor cart clutched in one hand like a jagged shiv. "'You self-righteous pricks!' he howled, spittle flying from his contorted maw. "'Trying to take away the only family that ever gave a shit about me? I'll bleed you all dry before I let that happen.' Marlin, put the bottle down, Blake shouted over the chaotic snarls. We're calling the police if you don't calm your crazy ass down. I'll kill you all first. Marlin's bulging gaze swiveled toward me as his wrist snapped forward, releasing the jagged projectile in my direction. Pure instinct took over. I lunged sideways. <laughs>
carpet just as the liquor bottle exploded against the wall mere inches from where my head had been. Pain blossomed in my shoulder from the impact, but I scrambled upright in time to see Marlin break free of his captor's hold. With a rabid shriek, he snatched up a nearby golf club, whipping it in a vicious forehand that caught one of Blake's friends flush in the sternum. The dull crack of metal on bone was obscenely loud, the man's scream gurgling off into silence as he collapsed like a rag doll. Unbridled panic seized my chest, but I refused to go down a helpless victim. Vaulting the sofa, I crashed into Marlin from behind, just as that makeshift bludgeon started arcing toward Blake's head. We slammed into the ground in a tangle of flailing limbs, the golf club clattering uselessly aside as my momentum drove us both into the entertainment center. Frames and knickknacks rained down in a shatter of glass and porcelain, but I scarcely felt any of it. We grappled furiously, each fighting for dominance like two reptilian brains stripped of reason. Marlin howled like a wounded animal as my clenched knuckles pounded against his face, splintering bone with a sickly series of muffled crunches. Blows ricocheted off my ribs, head, back. I screamed in unrestrained fury, raining down vicious retribution against the personification of every slight, every betrayal endured over those agonizing months. Until finally, Marlin's feeble resistance ceased, his battered form going limp beneath me. Only then did I realize the shrill ringing in my ears was my own voice, red-stained and hoarse from exertion. The metallic stench of blood saturated the hazy air, mingling with the scent of shattered hopes and shattered lives. Kira appeared silently in the doorway, her palm covering her mouth as tears streamed down her face. I glanced down at Marlin's ruined mess, my heaving chest caked with crimson. In that moment, I understood the cold truth that my freedom came at the cost of a piece of something irreplaceable. No going back now. This path had already consumed too much of my soul. The aftermath of that night was a blur of police statements, lawyer consultations, and round-the-clock news coverage speculating about the bloody family feud. Marlin ended up in the hospital under heavy security, while Jenna's friend Andrew remained in critical condition from the vicious golf club attack. The fallout extended far beyond physical wounds. My job terminated me on grounds of conduct violation, despite moving to dismiss the frivolous misappropriation investigation Marlin had fabricated. One more casualty in his path of destruction. For Kira's part, she tried putting on a brave face, assuring me we'd get through this latest storm clouds, that I'd acted in self-defense against Marlin's psychotic rampage. But I could see it in her eyes, too, that haggard, hollow look of someone eternally changed. Three miserable weeks crawled by before Marlin's hospital stay ended with his booking into county lockup. No chance at bail, the prosecutor assured us, given the menacing paper trail and violent charges filed by multiple victims. Perversely, having him behind bars brought no sense of relief. Only a dull, throbbing emptiness. Like my old life had been cut out with medical precision, leaving just a gaping wound struggling to heal. We need to get away from this place, Kira told me one night over the dinner she'd stopped insisting we eat together at the table. Get some distance before it consumes us, too. I grunted half-hearted agreement, pushing limp peas around with my fork. Every daily routine now felt like sleepwalking through a funhouse nightmare, all the familiar scenery present but twisted beyond recognition. So we went through the motions of forging an exit strategy. As the morning dew kisses the earth gently, I rise with the sun, feeling free, feeling plenty. In the quiet of dawn, where dreams unfold, I find solace and rhythm and stories untold. From the whispers of trees to the songs of birds, I draw inspiration from life's gentle words. In the symphony of nature, my spirit soars, a melody of hope behind closed doors. I lace up my shoes, hit the pavement light, each step a beat in the rhythm of life. With every breath, I rewrite my story in the stars shining bright. In the stillness of the morning, I find my flow. In the silence of the sunrise. Let it all go With every verse I Let my heart show In the gentle beginnings
In the hustle of the day, I find my stride With every challenge I face, I take it in my stride In the chaos of life, I seek to confide In the power of music where I can reside From the city streets to the open sky I spread my wings Ready to fly in the rhythm of motion, I amplify my dreams, my hopes, reaching for the skies. I paint my world with words, colors bright. In the canvas of life, I find my light. With every rhyme, I ignite a fire within, burning bright. In the stillness of the morning, I find my flow. In the silence of the sunrise, I let it all go. With every verse I let my heart show In the gentle beginnings, my spirit all grows So here I stand, in the twilight's embrace A storyteller, in this fast space With every word I speak, I trace My journey, my truth, leaving a trace So as the sun sets and the day's at rest I lay down my pen, feeling blessed In the gentle beginnings, I confess My love for this art, ever impressed Packing up what little either of us still clung to in preparation for putting the house on the market Finding new job prospects in cities far removed from the shadow of Marlin's reign of terror all the while, neither of us daring to verbalize what still hung unspoken, that no amount of geographic distance could fully heal the scars left on our marriage. The trust demolished, the intimacy shattered by forces we remained powerless to prevent. Kira's gaze told me she felt it too whenever our eyes met across the empty living room, that colossal rift, seemingly insurmountable. Yet in those fragile, solemn moments, I also caught fleeting glimpses of the steadfast partner who'd once fearlessly walked by my side, the woman whose loyalty and strength I'd fallen so irreversibly in love with those years ago before the darkness descended. It gave me just enough selfish hope to continue putting one foot in front of the other. The light at the end of that long, winding tunnel finally emerged on an overcast Tuesday morning when Kira called me at the temp labor job site I'd been grinding away at. This is it she said in a reedy tone usually reserved for graver matters. My last day. My heart hitched at her words, fingers anxiously combing through thinned clumps of hair. Last day. For what? At Oakview Elementary. I resigned this morning. A wavering sigh followed, like she'd removed an atlas-sized burden from her shoulders. We both need to start over completely, Rowan, to leave this behind and commit to rebuilding what's left. A profound mixture of emotions washed over me in that moment. Pride for her resolute spirit, grief for the treasured passions now abandoned, and something deeper, more profound, a sense of liberation, just as she'd described. We could leave the past six months, that entire abysmal chapter of torment, behind. Wipe the slate clean to reclaim the precious remnants of our fractured bond, and fortify them into something stronger— Something rebuilt from the ashes of Marlin's scorched earth campaign. Something reborn and tempered by the fire. My throat constricted as I absorbed the weight of her words, unable to respond. But some part of Kira must have sensed my unspoken thoughts through the static, because her voice softened to that familiar, comforting tone when she whispered, It's time to come home, babe, to each other. I swallowed hard against the surge of emotion, blinking back the sting in my eyes as the world outside seemed to reset on its axis. I'm already on my way. 